the seminar is a great opportunity to consider pathways and challenges to achieving human security after the pandemic. The presentations will be followed by input from the distinguished commentators from academia and practice, and conclude with a Q&A session with the floor, as I said. To welcome us to this event, we would like to call Ms. Chie Miyahara, Director General of the Jai Kaugata Research Institute, to give the opening remarks. Ms. Miyahara, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this seminar to launch the book Human Security and Empowerment in Asia Beyond the Pandemic. This event is co-hosted by the Sophia Institute for Human Security and the JICA Ogata Sadako Research Institute for Peace and Development. First of all, I would like to express our utmost gratitude to Professor Aoki, Director of the Sophia Institute for Human Security, for kindly agreeing to co-host the event and for providing such an excellent venue. We are very pleased to have uh, the opportunity to collaborate with uh, a research institute for the realization of human security through academic contributions. We are also happy to welcome students from Sofia University who are interested in this topic. We would like to uh, continue our collaboration for future events as uh, we share similar organizational missions. The first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic brought significant setbacks to our global development. It also challenged our understanding of human security. As we navigated through the various uncertainties that arose during the pandemic, we need to reevaluate our approach to human security by examining how we can pro protect and empower various vulnerable groups and populations. Given the fast-paced uh, fast nature of the world and the new global challenges we face, the pandemic era may seem like a distant memory. Yet, there are many lessons to be learned from this global health crisis that will shape our future. Does human security still matter in today's world? Our answer is an absolute yes. At the Launch Seminar for Human Security report last March, JICA's, uh, JICA's president, Professor Tanaka, started his speech with this phrase. JICA continues to strive for human security in, in its work. Of course, Japanese government has also made human security a guiding principle, as stated in the recently revised ODA charter. At the same time, the Ogata Research Institute continues its efforts to promote and disseminate the concept of human security. Today, we congratulate the editors and contributors of the book, Human Security and Empowerment in Asia Beyond the Pandemic. This book offers fresh insights into the human security concept and then presents uh, substantial learnings in oper operationalizing human security incorporating a wide range of complex situations, typologies of action, protection and empowerment actors. Equally important, the, uh, the book prompts readers to reconsider vulnerable populations agency in addressing pandemic challenges. There are eight cases, uh, there are eight case studies focusing on examples of vulnerable communities and groups during a complex crisis in Southeast Asia, namely Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and Japan. Through these cases, the book examines the diverse human security issues such as poverty, environmental security, food security, forced migration, gender, health, aging society, and peace and justice. To reach a greater audience, this book is made available in open access format. This afternoon, we will hear from the three esteemed editors of this book. They will share with us the features of this edited volume, the key takeaways in developing our deeper understanding of human security concept. 
and how we can apply them as we move beyond the pandemic. Once again, congratulations to all those involved in the publication of this book, and we look forward to healthy and uh, active discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miyahara, for your opening remarks. As she mentioned, today's event is co-hosted by a Sophia Institute for Human Security. We now would like to ask Professor Ken Aoki, Director of Sophia Institute for Human Security, to give the welcome remarks. So, Professor Aoki, the floor is yours. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Sophia University. I'm Ken Aoki a director of Sophia Institute for Human Security. I'm honored to have distinguished guests from JICA Ongata Sadako Research Institute for Peace and Development, Nayan Technological University, Ritzmeikan University, and to have prominent speakers at this symposium. Sophia Institute for Human Security, which co-hosts this event, is working to realize human security through social science research. Human security is the idea of expanding security, which has traditionally been for nations, to the security of each person, to human security. It seeks to address widespread threats to people's rights, livelihoods, and dignity. And ultimately, to bring people freedom from fear, freedom from want, and human dignity. In recent years, threats to human security have become increasingly diverse, including climate change, natural disaster, economic crisis, and violent con conflicts. Among these, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating impact on people around the world. That's as unimaginable just four years ago. In October of this year, JICA Ongata Research Institute published a book titled Human Security and Empowerment in Asia Beyond the Pandemic, which deals with human security under the COVID-19 pandemic. The book includes case studies of how vulnerable people in East Asian countries are promoting human security during the COVID-19 pandemic. At today's symposium, we will be able to hear the raised research results directly from the book authors themselves. I'm also looking forward to hearing about the book. So that's enough for my lengthy opening remarks. Shall we hear about the latest research? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Aoki, for your warm and heartful opening remarks. So now uh, I would like to introduce today's panelists. At first, Professor Yoichi Mine. He is the executive director of Jaika Ogata Research Institute and a professor of Doshisha University. His specialty is human security, and he's co-editor of the book. Second, I'd like to introduce Professor Amelie Caballero Anthony. She's a professor of international relations at RSIS Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. She's the lead editor of the book, and we are glad that she can join us today, all the way from Singapore. Thank you very much. Then, we would like to introduce Professor Sachiko Ishikawa. Uh, it is unfortunate that she is unable to join today by any means, so she will participate in a recorded presentation and will deliver her message. Professor Sachiko Ishikawa is a professor of Ritsumeikan University and a visiting fellow of Jaika Ogata Research Institute and a co-editor of the book. We have also two distinguished commentators. First, I would like to introduce Professor Kenki Adachi, at Ritsumeikan University, who will join later. Next, we'd like to introduce Ms. Tomoko Shimada. She is the director, Peacebuilding Office, Governance and Peacebuilding Department in JICA. 
So she has a lot of uh, on-field experience in conflict-affected countries. So now, let's move on to the presentations. We would like to proceed with introduction of the book project and JICA Ogata Research Institute works on human security by Professor Mine. Professor Mine, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction, Mutosan. Um, and also thank you very much, Mary, for the coming to Japan from Singapore. <laughs> and also the I thank the, um, the Professor Aoki and the people from the Sofia community for hosting this event. Thank you very much. So I'm Yoichi Mine. Um, I'm executive director of JICA Ogata Sadako Research Institute for Peace and Development. I'm sometimes uh, regarded as a uh, Mr. Human Security because I always talk about human security and write about human security. And But why? Uh, this is uh, chiefly because of Madame Ogata. Um, she established uh, JICA Research Institute in 2008, and I've been visiting a uh, research fellow at this uh, institute, um, you know, um, established on the initiative of Madame Ogata, and I had um, some you know, privileged occasions to attend meetings uh, with uh, Madame Ogata, and she really had a kind of galvanizing effect. <laughs> So when she talked about human security, um, so everybody listens. And actually, I my she changed my course of my academic life. So since then, I started to think about human security. And I happened to um, actually study uh, the uh, Amartya Sen's uh, development thinkings also. So the uh, Sen and Madame Ogata, um, so-called Madame Ogata, uh, Ogata Sen, Commission report was released in 2003. So since then, I started to invest in the notion idea of human security. So I feel very much honored uh, to be here at Sofia University, uh, which is the uh, home ground of the Madame Ogata. It was a home to uh, Madame, the late Madame Ogata. So I feel really honored. So thank you very much uh, for hosting this event today. So Aoki Sensei and others. And then, okay. So um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, in 2008, uh, the uh, Ogata Jaika Research Institute was uh, established. And then, I engaged in some kind of stock taking activities of the notion of human security, um, targeting East Asia. Uh, it's mainly ASEAN, but also the ASEAN plus three, uh, Japan, uh, China, and South Korea. So the this was a kind of the uh, originally two phase project um, uh, started in a began in 2013. And um, until today, this project has involved all, almost 50 scholars uh, region-wide uh, in the ASEAN plus three regions. It's combining document research and interviews and fieldwork. Okay, so um, in my presentation, uh, okay, maybe we'll talk uh, about the, our you know, research product, uh, the phase three outcome of the book, of the research project. And uh, I will give you um, context or background of um, the research, our research project on empowerment and human security. Okay, so the phase one of our research project was a theory oriented. Okay, this one is the uh, you know, cover picture of our phase one book, Human Security Norms in East Asia. Okay, so the next slide, please. Um, Actually, the research questions of phase one is like this. Um, this is theory oriented. So the, we had uh, three research questions. The first was the, what are general perceptions of threats to human security in East Asia? Okay. So we wanted to uh, give some kind of mapping of threats, um, East Asian region faces. And the second research question is to what extent has the idea of human security taking root in region and, uh, you know, ASEAN plus three countries. 
And the third question was about um, how do East Asia, I'm sorry, understand the concept of human security? Okay, some region specific interpretation. Okay, so this is the third research question. So we conducted surveys in 11 countries. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, I'm coughing, but it's not uh, infectious. And uh, this is allergy, so please don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, um, okay so the um, three, three uh, countries and Japan, China, South Korea, and ASEAN countries, but uh, we could not conduct uh, research in Laos and Brunei, uh, but other countries, uh, you know, researchers representing other countries joined the project. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the first research question, what are the major threats? So the, um, the, all these Asian researchers, scholars conducted uh, interview surveys and questionnaire surveys uh, targeting the policymakers and bureaucrats and journalists and civil society actors and business actors. And it's a lot of quite a comprehensive list of threats to human security. Okay, so climate change, typhoons, floods, volcano eruptions, earthquakes, tsunami, and diseases, and the food crises, the uh, you know health, education, environmental pollution, urbanization, poverty, unemployment, migration, human trafficking, violent conflicts, military conflicts, religious intolerance, and everyday crime, etc. It's very, very comprehensive set of the uh, threats. Uh, just, you know, the interviewees and respondents to questionnaires indicated all these threats to human security. So we have found the comprehensive UN definition of human security has been accepted in East Asia, um, in contrast with the responsibility to protect perspective. In, in our so-called R2P, you know, violent conflict is a chief, you know, issue, is a major issue of human security. But as a matter of fact, uh, this comprehensive understanding is um, taking root in East Asia. This was my, our, our first finding. And the second, you know, finding of the phase one uh, project is, okay. So is the idea of human security taking root? Okay. So the uh, majority answer was, oh, yes, but slowly, <laughs> slowly. And um, at the same time, uh, many respondents indicated that elements of human security are taking root. Elements, okay, like freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom to live in dignity or protection, empowerment. So the elements of human security are quite, you know, often referred to in, in the conversation and official documents. So the uh, scholars representing Vietnam, uh, she described the situation very nicely like this. Human security can be a jigsaw puzzle okay, in which the pieces are identified, but we have not been put together. Okay, uh, but they, they, these these you know, pieces have not been put together. Okay, um, so the people indicated. Okay, so human security parts are there. Okay, what we need is an extra push okay, to combine all these elements. Okay, this is the second finding, and the third finding. The okay, third question: How is the idea understood? Um, this is something we didn't expect. Uh, you know, this finding. Um, so, uh, so many stakeholders indicated that the state security is expected to contribute to human security. Maybe this is maybe Asia specific kind of answer. Yes, but honestly speaking, we didn't expect this answer. And typically, uh, the researcher representing China, um, he uh, described like this, a government as a necessary evil this is a very much a Western in invention. Okay. One revealing example is the use of the term parent officials in China to refer to government officials and people accept, expect them to play a paternalistic role in a positive way, positive way. So, but uh, not only uh, Chinese scholars, but also this kind of thinking, um, kind of, we expect some kind of benign provider of security uh, on the part of the government has been shared, uh, not all, but uh, quite many 
in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in South Korea, and even some Japanese stakeholders shared this kind of uh, attitude, uh, understanding of the role of the state. Okay. But at the same time, in many countries, people also mentioned civil society is important as a counterbalance, you know, it's not just, you know, state, but also the civil society is important. And the Philippines and Malaysia and the Thailand and the Singapore and the many, quite a number of scholars also indicated the critical role of civil society. So it's a kind of balance. You know? <laughs> okay, so uh, these are the uh, summary of the findings of the uh, phase one book. So let me proceed quickly to the uh, phase two research outcome. So now the we understand theory of human security and diffusion of the idea of human security region wide. So the phase two is more directly about practice, okay, practice of human security, not just talk, 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 but the practice of human security. Okay, um, the next slide. Okay, so research questions of phase two. We also. Uh, uh, you know, set out three research questions in this practice phase. Um, okay, so in human security practice in East Asia, some ch challenges have emerged. The first question, how should we cross national borders in emergency in an effective way? Okay, a nation state boundaries, how can we cross the border uh, to save the life of people? And the second question, how should we coordinate protection activities? And the third question was, how should we empower people in case of human security crisis? Okay, so we wanted to answer this question in promoting human security practice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, um, this is about practice. So practice of securing human security against some threats. So we began by classifying um, some threats and also, you know, we set out the case studies. Um, this uh, distinction of the physical system, the living system and the social system as sources of threats um, was formulated by President uh, Akihiko Tanaka of the, uh, our, you know, uh, JICA. Okay. So um, in his article uh, to other theory of human security, the earth is earth. Okay. Um, the, okay, um, the movement of the earth, uh, the Sichuan earthquake in China, and also the Japanese greatest Japan earthquake and tsunami in Aceh, and a cyclone and a typhoon in Myanmar and the Philippines. These are the case studies uh, of the threats uh, coming from the earth. And the second one is life, a living system or biosystem of the, you know, globe where we live. And in this case study, we chose uh, the Ebola crisis in West Africa. So these are Chinese activities in Africa. Um, this was research was conducted before COVID. And after COVID, uh, as you will see, we decided to dedicate one book on to this in very topic of pandemic. So this is the uh, in phase three research outcome. But anyway, this is a phase two. And um, the th third layer of the sources of human, uh, the threats to human security is humans by you know, themselves. So the case studies are land grabbing in Cambodia and Mindanao conflict and South Korea's refugee policies and human trafficking in Southeast Asia. Okay, so um, these are the topics in the next slide. Okay, findings. The first findings is how to cross the border, okay? So it is quite difficult to, difficult to answer this question, you know, how to cross the border effectively in, you know, uniform, uh, you know, pre-configured way. So this must be quite ad hoc, but our finding is international assistance is accepted. In case of violent conflict, uh, people tend to say, no, no, no. Um, but, uh, you know, in case of natural disasters, uh, people uh, accept uh, the, you know, assistance when mutual trust has been consolidated in peaceful time. Okay, this was a major finding. 
And the second findings was the horizontal coordination between stakeholders and also vertical communication to listen to grassroots voices, also important. And the third finding, which was quite important, and this actually leads to the present third phase, okay. Practitioners should pay attention to the sequence, speedy protection uh, in case of emergencies, and the resurgence of empowerment in the recovery phase. So people often talk about the combination of protection and empowerment. Yes, of course, it's important, but we also pay attention to this time horizon and temporal sequence. Okay. Protection first and empowerment follows. Oh, oh, time is up. <laughs> okay, the next, please. Okay, so almost the end of my presentation. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, this figure is reproduced uh, in the in the our book also. So the first phase in the time of crisis, the emergency is a you know very quick uh, protection is needed. So the uh, you know the op op the people and workers in operation and medical you know. Uh, specialists and, and 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 all all people should arrive uh, as quickly as possible to protect uh, people's lives, but uh, this must be followed by continuous uh, persistent efforts to promote empowerment. And next, please. So the then the after this second phase was over, uh, we faced the uh, pandemic, the outbreak of COVID nineteen. So the protection is important in case of, uh, you know, some medical crisis and uh, to cope with the pandemic. But elements of empowerment should be carefully incorporated at the beginning, uh, you know, in the protection strategy as well. So this was our, you know, research question. And we decided, we asking for the help uh, from Meli. <laughs> Thank you for your joining us uh, and supervising this project. And we, you know, have voila, the next slide. Okay, the final one. It, this is the uh, book, uh, the phase three book, our latest contribution, you know, a human security and empowerment in Asia. So the now the my colleague, uh, okay, Professor Kawajira Anthony will talk about uh, this book. And this is open access volume. If you are interested, I'm sure you are interested because you are here. <laughs> so you can download the book for free okay, from the uh, Routledge website. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Amine, for your comprehensive presentation, uh, introducing uh, all the act research activities of our research institute. We now move to our next presentation by Professor Caballero Anthony. She will present about human security and empowerment in Asia beyond the pandemic about the book. Uh, Professor Caballero Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me begin by thanking uh, the host of this uh, launch, um, <clears throat> uh, Sophia Diversity Center for Human Security, Professor Aoki. And of course, to uh, the JICA uh, Human Security and the Research Institute for inviting me to join this um, this project. Um, Professor Mine, as, as, she, as he has uh, uh, comprehensively discussed, um, has shown how much of human security, I can have the next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, how much human security is, is important. And I guess for this particular project, um, it's, it's worth iterating why human security now. Um, I think more than ever, the concept and the policy application of human security has become even more uh, critical in light of what we had experienced in the last three years. Uh, in my conversation with the JICA colleagues this morning, we were just reflecting how, you know, how, how we went through, how, uh, how Imagine, unimaginable that we actually went through three years of, of uh, a pandemic that is uh, described as a once in a lifetime, once in a century pandemic, and that it affected about 6 million uh, 
pe people have died and over 600 million people that have been uh, infected by it. So if you look at the slide on, on the right, you can see it, this was adopted from the Human Development Report, how much uh, of a regression the crisis has, has, uh, has actually affected. Uh, the prospects of human development among the populations at large. And this particular case study, as Professor Mini has, has uh, indicated earlier, really just focuses on the impact of COVID-19, uh, particularly on the vulnerable groups and, uh, and communities in Southeast Asia. And there's, of course, a case study in Japan making up the eight studies. And the extent to which the whole concept of uh, protection and specifically empowerment um, is actually um, reflected or is actually shown. And um, it's uh, the next series of slide is just actually, I will run through it very fast because um, when we went through these studies, we actually sort of reviewed how much of the human security concept has evolved. And if you look at it um, the, from the uh, emphasis on the different elements of human security, focusing on chronic threats, and sudden uh, uh, disruption, which of course COVID-19 is one of them, to the focus on protection and empowerment, which uh, was in the Commission uh, of Human Security 2003 report, which highlighted these two elements as part really of a strategic approach to, um, to implement human security. And the third uh, on which has an emphasis on solidarity, which I shall uh, come to in a while. So very briefly, the next slide is just shows you the different elements, which as we all know, is now that human security as we understood it, is freedom from fear and freedom from want, and of course, the uh, uh, push towards human uh, dignity. And the next one, please. The second is uh, empowerment, which as, as I said, are critical uh, protection and empowerment as critical strategies to promote human security. And the notion that protection is essentially seen as a top-down approach, while empowerment is really uh, putting a lot of emphasis on agency, people as actors and participants in defining and implementing their vital, realizing their vital freedoms from a bottom-up perspective. And the third one, I think it is important to reflect on in the context of what we actually face today. And, and why was the special report on human security in 20, and 2022 talked about solidarity? It's, it's really essentially because of the nature of the threats that we have now. In the first slide, we say, why human security now? In the 2022 report, it actually focuses on the part on, on the, the need to actually mobilize others to help communities realize human security for the very reason that the world is increasingly not just interconnected, but deeply uh, interdependent. You know, uh, we can see how climate change affects all of us. Our action affects others, right? And how much of the pandemic uh, has has uh, has played on again the interdependencies when we do we, when we don't do anything our supply chain is affected right uh, when we don't have uh, uh, vaccines then the the rest of of the world that doesn't have um, access to that become challenged and that will continue to per perpetuate the the threat of the pandemic and second not just the deepening uh, is really the capacity of the state which is severely challenged as a result of these interdependencies and unable to guarantee human security therefore empowerment uh, as as a concept alone is not sufficient uh, as such but it needs for that to actually be realized you really need to bring together various stakeholders such as local groups international organizations, civil society, religious communities, and the private sector. And that has actually, um, uh, that kind of thinking and approach is actually reflected in the case studies that we have, um, we have gathered uh, throughout this project. Next slide. Uh, Professor Mini has talked about the nexus between protection and empowerment, but in emerging and sudden crises, there's always this argument that in as much as you want to, you know, uh, reduce the level of protection and, and increase the level of empowerment in certain communities and in certain types of groups that are particularly vulnerable, right? 
you know, empowerment is a very slow process. And there might, there might be a time when protection has to be extended further, while at the same time ensuring that your protection policies actually have with it accompanying empowerment possibilities. As uh, professor, the late Professor Ogata has said, it is when people are empowered that they can make better choices and actively prevent and mitigate the impact of insecurity. But that is easier said than done in certain cases and in certain types of conflict. Um, next, please. So I will skip that. That has been already been uh, so inclusive. This is really the, the thrust of the project is in light of what we know as the progress of human security. What about human security for vulnerable groups and communities that are acutely and disproportionately impacted by COVID-19? This was the thrust of the project. And when you talk about population that are disproportionately and acutely affected, you talk about the poor, right? You talk about those that are uh, food insecure, you talked about populations that have been forcedly displaced. You talk about the impact on women, and you talk about the impact on the aged population and in communities where they are uh, in conflict settings. But uh, so we, we try to identify the specific challenges and the opportunities for empowerment as seen through the eight case studies, which actually provided different narratives and practices of how this affected group and communities tried to manage, right, the kind of crisis, multiple crises, as a result of one threat, which is really the threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, now I will go straight into the findings of the study. The first is COVID-19 has really, um, illustrated more, uh, perhaps more, more powerfully, the complexity of threats to human security, right? COVID-19 is a health crisis, started out as a health crisis. Then it suddenly, because of the emergency measures and the lockdowns, it led to a spiraling economic crisis. If you recall, uh, the economies, particularly in the in the, in the poorer, uh, in the less developed countries, actually lost about you know it went down to as a, 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 a economic downturn to as low as four to five percent, right? And that economic crisis also led to a number of crises like food insecurity, right? And even um, physical security for uh, for particular vulnerable populations. When, when we had our uh, case study on health and the, the case study looked at the impact on health workers, the, the women health workers who were the, the who were most of in, in Southeast Asia, particularly in the case of the Philippines, they were the primary caregivers, right? But then because of all of this crisis, then it actually also highlighted and brought to the fore some of the insecurities that they already felt, um, which I will come back in, in a while. So the health crisis, which is COVID-19, have shown, as I said, the cross-cutting impact of economic security, food insecurity, and even environmental security. And in one of the case studies, uh, the environment actually has become the referent of, uh, of security. We always think about human security as the difference between human security and the traditional security is that while the traditional notion of security was very state-centric, the significant contribution of the concept of human security is that it actually brought from the state focus, state centric focus of referent of security to the security of individuals. But as reflected uh, as a result of, of COVID-19, the environment also became, you know, the, envir the security of the environment also became endangered because of the practices of throwing, you know, um, medical uh, equip, uh, goods, you know, the mask, uh, and, and all other things, and of uh, and, and and the way you know humans have started to to um, uh, not to effectively or, or properly dispose of some of the things that they were actually using, right? So the growing complexity of threats to human security. The second finding, next please, is that it compounded the vulnerabilities of people 
or the insecurities of people that are already vulnerable. So for the undernourished, the health crisis or the pandemic has severely restricted their ability and, the, and, and, and their uh, access to food, right? It became very difficult for them to access not just food, but even essential services, right? Such as healthcare, and again, further exacerbated their economic insecurity. So if you think about the crisis itself generating other crises, you know, we always think about what is an issue that generates other crises. We always think about climate change, right? Climate change is a threat multiplier. But COVID-19 has shown that it can also multiply, right? It can bring about other crises. But if, if, and if you look at the impact of that on, this, on, the, on, the, uh, on the security reference, which is the individuals, the persons, particularly those that are vulnerable, you're also compounding their vulnerabilities. A common word that, has all, that we, we have seen in the chapters is that, you know, complex, more vulnerable, right more insecure so it becomes almost like you know heightened if, if you talk about adjectives it's it becomes almost if it is what superlatives have been have been included in the description right so for the urban poor it has aggravated their economic condition and their ability right for the poor not just to improve or but it even affected the education of their children, right? This was very, that was uh, highlighted in the, the paper that we had on economic, on, on poverty in the case of Vietnam. On, on women, right, uh, they, they uh, actually, it became problematic because it worsened, right, some of the marginalization of women. And we have seen that in the case of the pandemic, right, they became one of the most at-risk groups uh, that that uh, that we we discovered in some of the societies in the case studies that we have that we have seen right. Um, next, and as uh, as you compound the vulnerabilities, the reason why these vulnerabilities are compounded because the structural impediments of the vulnerable com faced by the vulnerable communities are reinforced, right. Um, so already you're facing, you know, poverty is supposed to be, you're supposed to get out of that. But because of the pandemic, you're reinforced or you, you uh, I increase that cycle of vicious poverty, one that they cannot break off. As we all know, um, that, that the, one of the agendas now of, of countries in the region is really to have a, what they call a, a faster recovery from the pandemic. But even that, I'm, I'm going there. I know it's one minute. The recovery has been very slow, right? Um, in chapter three, it also talks about if, if you were, uh, you know, food is the case studies was looking at the, the very poor um, on food, particularly those that uh, were affected by the, the constant disasters. This was the case studies in Indonesia. And it became a constant struggle if food security is supposed to be improved because of more access to food as a result of the pandemic, right? It again exacerbated the, 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 the lack of access and uh, it became a struggle to avoid hunger and famine. On health security, as I said, it highlights what they call the hidden pandemic, right? In times of crises, particularly crises, we actually saw a rising case of domestic violence and restricted access of women to essential uh, reproductive health services and supply, right? So, it, however, one of the case studies, particularly in the case of Japan, when you look at displaced populations, that while you have all of these uh, vulnerabilities, but when the right and um, efficient and fast protection is provided, right? Um, then you can actually start to see how communities, while struggling to, uh, to address the insecurity, have tried to empower themselves. So the, the, the uh, program of emergency cash, uh, cash transfer have seen to be a most efficient means to address hunger because it empowered recipients to have more choices in developing uh, in, in purchasing food, developing skills here, as shown in the Indonesian paper, was, you know, they were actually taught to, you know, to, to have kiosks, to build kiosks so that they could sell, right? While they purchase food, they are also able to purchase things that they could actually sell. So in a way, 
perverse that it may, it may sound, you actually develop some business skills. And in chapter five, where we look at the impact of those that were displaced as a result of the disasters, the giving them speedy housing, right, had uh, gone a long way in addressing the social, the social, social psychosocial needs in, and providing an enabling environment for communities that were displaced to cope and help build capacity and resilience. Next, I'll go next. Um, the pandemic has also shown how the issue of protection of the environment became important in the case of the Sitaran River in Indonesia, right? This was a, a detrimental effect on the health of the river, but then this also led to actions by civil society groups to actually address this pollution that was getting worse, right? Next, <clears throat> next slide. And as shown in the other case studies on gender, um, it actually also, uh, in as much as women were, uh, were particularly and disproportionately affected, this particular case study showed that when women actually uh, claim back or exercise agency, they can actually help other women as well. Using the framework of women, peace and security, the advocacy of certain women's groups in the Philippines had shown that it became invaluable, not only in providing protection, but empowering other women, right? to develop the capacity to engage in peace building and development. So it was like women helping other women, right? And next. <clears throat> but what uh, this also showed that empowerment can come at multiple levels, right? It can, uh, you, you know, uh, in the peace building chapter, um, it provides provided uh, insights on how multi-level empowerment and strategies done by the Philippine government on the empowerment and uh, protection and empowerment of the people in the barn region in the Philippines show that uh, th this could actually happen despite the fact that they were faced with with the problem of the pandemic, right? And uh, the author of this particular framework uh, paper, which will be Professor Ishikawa, who will come in a while, describes how um, if the there is close interaction between the national and the, and the local government in dealing in the strategies to deal with the pandemic while managing other risks and fragilities, you can actually help communities empower themselves. And last, um, so the, the, the case studies, it showed really a mixed picture, right? That protection is still very much needed, particularly for the most vulnerable. But at the same time, it shows that, you know, communities themselves, while they are needing more protection, they cannot be and have shown to be not really passive. And they have actually played uh, uh, an active part in making a more inclusive and transformational process to empower people despite the fact that they have this huge crisis facing them. Um, and last but not least is that when you talk about protection and empowerment, uh, this is actually um, reinforces the earlier studies done by Professor Mini and, and group, is that it, it cannot just be a one-sided or a two-sided uh, approach. It really requires multi-stakeholder, so multi-level and multi-stakeholder uh, commitment, right? Both from the government and from the state and other non-state, sorry, the government, which is the state and other non-state actors to, to bring together, right? A, a, a combination of protection and empowerment to address the human security needs in times of sudden disruption, such as the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Professor Caballero Anthony, thank you very much for your rich and insightful uh, and informative presentation. So then let us deliver Professor Ishikawa's recorded presentation about overview of the uh, case studies in the book. So she will elaborate more detail of what uh, Professor Caballero Anthony referred to. Good evening. I'm Sachiko Ishikawa one of the editors of this book project. Since I'm not able to attend this book launching event in person, let me briefly present overview of the case studies. In most of the cases, the primary government protection was recognized 
in the pandemic's early stages, although the lockdown measures intensified human insecurity in multiple ways. The authors of each chapter focus on several human security challenges in specific country context. The central question of this book uh, examine concerns now how people can empower themselves to strengthen their own human security rather than rely on uh, protection provided by the government. No. Uh, chapter authors thus examine how human security evolved through the challenges you know, presented by the spread and process of containment of COVID-19, uh, exploring the some critical implications related to the empowerment pe of people and communities. The eight case studies covered five countries, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and Japan, with each case study addressing a human security issue. The issues addressed are varied and range from food security to the conflict. As the pandemic spread, the most national government in the case studies took on a responsibility for protection, primarily through the adaptation of lockdown measures, except Japan. Then the various pro, uh, policies other than lockdown to protect the lives of vulnerable people were progressively implemented. In Indonesia, one case study observed emergency cash transfer program, while another case study highlighted environmental education, which raised uh, awareness of residents uh, on plastic waste pollution in the river. In the Philippine case studies, the diverse agendas and positions of the recipients of government protection are reflected in different evaluation of government policies. In Thailand, cash support was provided in the form of digital money transfer, which left behind many of the elderly who knew little about information technology. In Vietnam case, it exposed the double uh, burden of the urban poor who are situated outside health uh, insurance coverage or uh, repeatedly join and quit due to poverty. In Japan, elderly people who had been displaced by the uh, floods appreciated the temporary shelters of the government provided that provision of temporary housing was valued as a step toward uh, empower empowering the evacuees. For measuring empowerment in this book, Naira covers three parameters, namely resources, the conditions uh, under which choices are made, agency, the process by which choices are made, and achievement, the outcomes of choices were employed. The case studies have revealed that there is no single model for empowerment and that differences in terms of class, ethnicity, religion, um, and gender make empowerment strategy vary. The case studies have also pointed out significance of time factor, which could change the empowerment strategies in any given context. The case study shows that there are different dynamics and st stages of empowerment 
partly because empowerment remains a uh, potentiality in most case studies. Aside from you know, Kabir's you know, three parameters, we employed World Bank's four institutional conditions of empowerment to examine whether some aspects of these conditions could be found in the case studies. The four institutional conditions empowerment are access to information, inclusion and participation, accountability, and local organizational capacity. Due to limited time, I cannot mention individual case studies. Um, here, I will talk about what we can learn from the mapping of case studies you are looking at. It is encouraging to see various forms of in institutional stepping stones toward further em empowerment across Southeast Asia. The table shows that empowerment practices during the pandemic were touchy, with people's voluntary care functioning as a substitute where the government did not consider itself responsible. Now, active grassroots care reflected people's agency, but should not be confused with empowerment as there was no other options for people. The analysis of eight case studies reveals lessons that must be kept in mind where that are uh, responding to uh, possible new pandemics in the future. They are, um, preparation is necessary in normal times. Genuine support should reach the most vulnerable, the poor, the elderly, and destitute women. Why protecting? Well, the government needs to take into account the conditions of people's empowerment. Finally, our efforts to promote human security through the combination of empowerment and protection should continue in the post-COVID-19 era. Thank you for your attention. Uh, the professor Adachi uh, is um, uh, specialized in theories of international polit politics and has a comprehensive insight on human security. And you're from Ritsumeka University. So, Professor Adachi, uh, if uh, you are ready to make any uh, comments or any uh, findings from the uh, book and also uh, the concept of human security, especially in the empowerment aspect. I uh, would like to listen to your thoughts. Sure. Uh, Dr. Muto, thank you very much uh, for introducing me. Uh, so I'm Ken Adachi uh, from Ritsumeikan University. Uh, it is my pleasure to be part of this uh, symposium. I wish I could be there with you uh, in person at the uh, Sofia University. I love Sofia University. Actually, I spent one year as a visiting professor. Uh, I think uh, eight or seven or eight years ago. Uh, so I really, I really love this uh, campus. Uh, but unfortunately, because of my uh, schedule, I couldn't be there. Uh, so allow me to join you uh, online. Uh, and I hope uh, the we don't have any technical issue uh, with my uh, comments. Uh, but anyway, I'm I'm really uh, uh, honored to be part of this uh, the very important symposium uh, celebrating the book launch of this uh, important book. Uh, so first, uh, allow me to extend. Uh, my congratulations on the publication of this book, Human Security and Empowerment in Asia Beyond the pa Pandemic. Uh, the, over the last three decades, a substantial body of research on human security uh, has accumulated with uh, JICA Research Institute standing out as a pivotal institution in generating such uh, scholarly output, uh, including the books uh, the Professor Mine uh, just introduced. Uh, the output of phase one research and phase two research, as well as this uh, phase three research. And the, as emphasized in this uh, the book uh, for the output of the, uh, the third phase, uh, existing research on human security predominantly 
are focusing on the conceptual evolution of the term uh, with insufficient attention directed toward the uh, practicalities of protect, protecting and empowering uh, human security. Uh, consequently, this uh, publication is deemed invaluable for directly addressing the issues surrounding protection and empowerment. Uh, additionally, as the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded while this book was in development, it provides a compelling analysis of how nations and people responded to various human security challenges amid the pandemic, uh, specifically focusing on Asian countries such as Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Japan. This book uh, elucidates how these nations and people in these nations navigated diverse human security challenges during the pandemic, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. While uh, this book does not conduct the comparative analysis per se, uh, this book nevertheless offers uh, valuable insights into the understanding into understanding the variations in responses and underlying factors influencing these variations. Uh, moreover, uh, this book aims to measure empowerment in each case. Unfortunately, the uh, Professor Ishikawa's uh, presentation or the video presentation was not broadcasted there. Actually, that's the only thing I could actually see in advance. Uh, so I was preparing the comments uh, based on that, but uh, I'm, I'm going to skip that. But anyway, uh, the, this book actually aims to measure empowerment in each case and uh, its utilization of uh, in neither Kabir's uh, three parameters and the World Bank's uh, four institutional conditions provide valuable insight into the nuanced nature of the uh, empowerment. So I really uh, enjoy reading uh, this book. And actually, I could probably continue in this vein all night, uh, listing the commendable aspects of this book. However, uh, my task is to present, I think, uh, potential areas for improvement or suggest uh, avenues for future research. And at that point, uh, three uh, points come to my mind. Uh, first, uh, the unique nature of the COVID-19 pandemic demands further exploration. In a context of the um, pandemic in which an unknown and highly lethal virus spread globally with unprecedented speed and scale, the COVID-19 was unparalleled. While acknowledging the possibility of similar pandemics in the future, this book could benefit from a more expl explicit discussion on the extent to which these issues addressed are specific to COVID-19. For example, the, given the global nature of the pandemic, countries may have drawn from each other's experience in uh, formulating the policies, uh, thereby influencing aspects of protection and empowerment. In other words, uh, it is crucial to consider the perspective that the policies of each country were not independent, but rather influenced each other. And the manner in which such interaction among the policies of different countries occur also uh, signif significantly uh, varies depending on when the policies of each country are analyzed. Uh, actually, in the slide uh, prepared by the Professor Ishika, I mentioned about that, but uh, in the concluding chapter as well, uh, it was pointed out that the time factor was important. Uh, and I believe that the aspect of the protection and empowerment and how each country's policies were influenced by other countries differed considerably depending on the timing of the analysis of each case study. Uh, it may be interesting to compare the timing of the cases more consciously or to analyze several cases by selecting a comparable timing. That's the uh, first comment. And relatedly, uh, the emphasis in the last section Lessons learned for the future pandemic that genuine support should reach the most valuable is, I think, rather obvious. I feel that more suggestion for the future could be made if this book uh, took a closer look at what was preventing each country from doing so, I mean, uh, to uh, supporting uh, the most valuable, and whether it was due to the factors specific to COVID-19 or not, or what conditions were in place when it was successful in providing support to the most vulnerable. So that's the first point came to my mind. And a second, a more detailed examination of empowerment conditions prior to the onset of COVID-19 would enrich this book's tips. Uh, I felt that way. Uh, the discussion and the chapters mainly analyze the protection policies under COVID-19 and the subsequent uh, empowerment. However, analyzing the empowerment situation preceding the pandemic is crucial as the efficacy of protection policies during the crisis is contingent 
upon the level of empowerment beforehand. A more empowered and resilient country, region, or community of people will require minimal protection uh, for the population as a whole, and will be able to focus more protection policies on the more vulnerable. Thus, uh, investigating how the empowerment situation preceding the crisis contributes to the resilience would provide valuable insights. These uh, considerations will be extremely important as we continue to explore the theme of this book, uh, Human Security and Empowerment, and consider the significance of uh, empowerment for improving human security. That's number two. And lastly, number three, uh, the, this book could gain uh, from a more precise and a consistent definition of empowerment, I thought. Uh, in the introduction, but this book refers to the definition of empowerment by the UNDP 2003 report, that is the people's ability to act on their own behalf and on their on behalf of others. And the um, Professor Kabbalah Anson, I, I think, uh, prepare, prepared the slide for the definition. She, she just skipped it. And also the Professor Ishikawa's uh, video message uh, emphasized that part. And also uh, the, in the concluding chapter, it emphasized that the uh, this book examined how can people empower themselves to strengthen their own human security rather than relying solely on protection provided by the state and stated the active grassroots care reflected people's agency, but should not be confused with the empowerment as uh, there was no other option uh, for the people. I was confused uh, when I was reading this. Uh, even there, if even if uh, there are no other means, if people have the ability to address the difficulties in human security through grassroots care, can it not be said that they are empowered according to the definition? Isn't the fact that there is an option that there was grassroots and voluntary care in itself an indication that people are empowered? This book seems to focus too much on kind of top-down empowerment or empowerment by the government, contrary to the definition of empowerment it addresses. Uh, the book's focus on government and top-down empowerment might overlook the significance of bottom-up empowerment. Also, you repeatedly refer to that kind of a concept, the bottom-up empowerment. What does it matter if people are empowered from the below to create the uh, possibility for themselves to live safely and with dignity, even if they are forced to do so or have no other choice but to do so? In Japan, for example, the term uh, the self-help uh, public assistance and the uh, mutual aid, uh, jijo, kojo, uh, kyojo, uh, have been discussed for a while recently. And while it is certainly problematic uh, to emphasize self-help and mutual aid in order to justify the lack of public assistance or protection, isn't it also positive for empowerment to have self-help and mutual aid system in place? Well, reading this book made me think uh, about these things. And I think this book is important in that it provides an opportunity to delve into these issues. But anyway, in conclusion, this book serves as a critical platform for exploring the intricate relationship between human security and empowerment. And a claim in this book that endeavors to promote human security through a blend of empowerment and protection should continue beyond the COVID-19 era is well supported I totally agree with this uh, statement. And I, exp I express the hope that JICA Research Institute will continue to play a central role in advancing research in this field. So that's uh, all uh, from me. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Professor, that you really appreciate your uh, great contribution and deep insight about the book, uh, not only the present from the presentation, but as a whole book, and also from the really deep concept of human security. It's really insightful, and you gave us a lot of future perspective for uh, the research. We really appreciate your intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now we would like to move on to uh, the next uh, commentator. Uh, Ms. Uh, Tomoko Shimada. Uh, so Shimada-san, the floor is now yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for gi uh, giving me today's opportunities, especially for uh, Sofia Universities. Uh, I'm Tomoko Shimada, uh, Director of Office for Peace Building, uh, JICA. Uh, our office is engaged in various projects, peace building projects, in, uh, mainly in Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. 
Today, I would like to talk as a practitioner uh, on the ground uh, on three perspectives, which illustrate that the finding from the book is very compatible with our efforts in the field. First, let me point out the similarity in the framework of our cooperation uh, and the approach that are demonstrated in this book. As, in, uh, as you can see on the screen, this is a, a kind of uh, one of our strategy, JICA's peace building strategy. As introduced in chapter one, uh, combining a concept of combining of, of empowerment and protection is important. Protection is needed in an emergency situation, but the pursuit of empowerment from the earliest possible stage is eventually needed. This is consistent with the direction of our strategy. Uh, JICA's peace building strategy uh, aims to contribute to the creation of resilient states and societies that can prevent violent conflict and to build peaceful and inclusive societies. When building a resilient state and society, JICA takes a human security approach that combines protection and empowerment that is top-down capacity development and institution building of government that is trusted by the people, and bottom-up empowerment of the people and the co communities to formulate a resilient society. In order to build a government that is trusted by the people, it is necessary to improve functional, inclusive, and responsive public services on the other hand, to formulate a resilient society, a wide range of initiatives are needed, including social intervention, uh, so social integration, and empowerment of communities. When protection and empowerment uh, work in tandem, and the government and the people play their respective roles based on trust, the risk of conflict will be reduced, and the capacity of the state and the society to respond to the crisis will be strengthened. Second, uh, I would like to focus on Mindanao, Philippines, which is introduced as one of the case studies in this book. Jake has been providing peace building assistance for many years in Mindanao, although COVID-19 uh, COVID coincide, coincided with a period of transition. We have seen the effective functioning of the relationship of, of trust between the central government of the Philippines and the Bansamo Transition Authority through the peace process, as well as the network of civil society organizations that have been built over many years of peace promoting activities to bring people together. Furthermore, as pointed out in this book, it was rather an opportunity to build a strong institution and society through this response under pandemic. I believe the cooperative relationship between the central government, Bansamo Transition Authority, and local government will remain key in the future. So JICA would like to make use of such assets in our projects while aiming to contribute to the capacity development of transition authority that is trusted by people in Mindanao. As a final, a final point, I believe Empowerment strategy will work in areas where the state is fragile. For example, the Sahel region of West Africa is currently highly unstable due to violent extremism beyond borders. In such conflict-affected areas, JICA is trying to build trust through collaboration between local governments and residents through uh, our education project called School for All which is centered on strengthening the organization of school management committee uh, organized by people. This project aims at uh, developing local organizational capacity to provide continued educational opportunities, especially for vulnerable groups such as internally displaced persons. Thus, in areas where the state is fragile, the challenge is to increase resilience through empowerment of the society as a whole by having diverse actors such as communities and local organizations cooperative, uh, cooperate each other. And to link, with, link these uh, uh, activities with government protection is very important. Although state institutions are well established in Southeast Asian cases in this book, 
We would like to see further research on empowerment in situations where the state is fragile. In this way, the effort to strengthen the co connection with the government that provides protection and local assets may be effective in areas where the crisis continues. Uh, we, as a pro practitioner, uh, too, will continue to return to the issues presented in this book and examine whether JICA's peace building projects are being conducted in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Shimada, for your presentation. It's really comprehensive and elaborate what uh, JICA, uh, as an implementing agency of ODA, is doing, uh, and, and with from the uh, perspective of human security. Thank you very much. So, following the two excellent presentation, uh, we are we hope we are able to continue our discussion. And well, I'm afraid Professor Adachi may have left already. But if you are still here, would you like would you please uh, turn your camera on? And we I hope we are able to enjoy this discussion. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, so then uh, at first uh, I would like to ask the editors uh, of the book according to the order of the presentations uh, to, to, to give us a reflection uh, to the two uh, comments, commented as comment. So first we'd like to start from Professor Mine. Oh, th thank you so much. And uh... I have a lot of things to <laughs> talk about, but just, okay, let me focus just one point, uh, especially uh, is raised by Professor Adachi, is about the top-down and bottom-up empowerment. Uh, this is a very good point. Um, yes, and uh, it's very much understandable. Okay, Ano Sasuga Adachi Sensei, okay. Um, uh, he found- Well said, Dr. Adachi. I would say deliberate. <laughs> it's a kind of it's okay. So some the focuses are different in introduction. Uh, I think we focused more about uh, bottom up kind of freedom to choose. You know, Naira Kabir's uh, um, argument of the you know uh, more more yeah bottom up kind of empowerment. Uh, so this is a quite a kind of mainstream argument of empowerment we endorsed and we wanted to um, you know fleshing out. Um, and and but and the conclusion. This is also JICA commissioned research, so we wanted to draw conclusion for you know practitioners. <laughs> so at the conclusion, we you know focused on the institutional conditions to promote empowerment. So this may sound top down because we are JICA. I'm very sorry. <laughs> so uh, we wanted to uh, complement uh, each other, the you know bottom up and top down. So this was is I think our in intention. Okay, so I stop here. So Mary, I think you can maybe continue and elaborate. Yeah. Um, uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Adashi yeah, for, for, I think, pushing us to think further as to how we can best improve uh, <clears throat> a research project. Um, it's always very good to, to think about better ways of doing it and to um, and, and to flesh the, the project further. And I think your second point, Professor, about, uh, you know, measuring empowerment before and after, I think is important. But the, the uh, in, how to do that, I think, is, is a major, uh, th there's some uh, research um, constraints that we face, considering that we actually undertook this research during uh, the height of the pandemic. And second is that, when you focus on vulnerable communities, um, you need to be able to systematically have a, a good um, framework, right, to measure to, to the extent to which they actually have been empowered before that, right? And um, I, I would say it's, it's going to be a real uh, challenge, but if we're able to do that in the, uh, you know, not now, but perhaps other scholars can do it, it's actually good because, uh, which brings me to the third point. Um, if you actually look um, deeper into how each of the author have discussed empowerment, attempts at empowering themselves, you actually see that. So the very bottom-up approach was very visible in the chapters, right? Despite, the, for example, the, the case on food insecurity, you're looking at displaced population in Indonesia that, you know, that were actually already suffering from disasters, so they were, and crisis hit, 
and suddenly they became food insecure. So the government, as a way to protect them, to provide assistance, gave them, you know, cash transfers, which is in fact very good. But how do they use that, right? The government will probably tell them this is how you should do it. But they exercise their choice in looking at the most immediate needs that they attending to the most immediate needs. And sometimes top down approach may not necessarily gel uh, uh, with the bottom up in terms of the ability of the affected communities to exercise that choice. You know, because to them, the government says you do this, but yes, we will do this, but we will focus on first, first providing, uh, uh, buying food, different types of food, and buying food that perhaps we could also sell so that we can also have the income, right? So that ability to choose the strategy is in fact a very good um, example of empowerment, not defined by textbook, but empowerment as practiced. Right. The other thing about empowering uh, other communities, I mean, in the in, in the uh, chapter on gender, right? Already, th th they were they they're, they're facing some discrimination and uh, some challenges, some women's groups. But the empowerment is shown by again bottom up groups, women's groups helping others and not waiting for the government to actually come and provide them that assistance. So I invite you to to read the book the case studies closely to, to actually see how much empowerment has been done to the extent possible, despite the constraints that they faced. Um, one point about, you know, our states in, uh, you know, the timeline again, Professor, is, is very important because at certain point, you know, in the case of the health, uh, the, the impact on, on the health workers in the Philippines, in the first six months to perhaps nine months of the disaster uh, of the disaster of the crisis, you could really see the kind of crises and exclusion and marginalization that were faced. But to, uh, you know, as governments decided uh, are able to have the ability to manage the situation, right? Perhaps because they were able to to learn more about how to manage the the pandemic and also learn from the others then of course that level of perhaps a vulnerability has been reduced because of the government's attempt to 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 correct that so there's in fact um, a lesson in looking at specific timelines so teasing that out right so Indeed, uh, that is something that perhaps can be dealt with in, in a continuum or paper writers could then say further to, right? It's always good to, to reflect on what has happened then, right? And, and what has happened after. Um, but, but one thing is, is for sure, something that has really come out um, that, you know, when, when pushed to a corner, right? When, when people are really pushed to a corner, vulnerable communities as such, um, it's it's quite uh, amazing how, in spite of the crisis that they feel, in spite of you know structural impediments, I talked about reinforcing structural impediments. You know the latitude of choices for people, right? In as much as you think, oh, they should actually be doing this, it's really important, and that is one of the one of the one of the slides that Professor Ishikara was supposed to have shown. It's important for scholars and practitioners, right, to see, uh, to understand context, right? What is the context of the communities that are affected? How much space do they actually have? And the extent of agency that, you know, it's good to say, you know, scholars will say, give them the agency, give them to do that. But are they able to do that when structural impediments are even more compounded, right? So in as much as we want to push for empowerment, sometimes that length the, the, the period of protection has to be there. And I think this is salient for, for JICA and other <laughs> developmental agencies. We expect communities to immediately get up, you know, to recover, right? That's resilience. But when, you know, and I think that your, your uh, point uh, about, uh, um, you know, examining empowerment in conflict settings, yeah. to what extent, uh, how much space do communities actually have, vulnerable communities, right? For, for the aged, right? In in um, in in the, the case study on Thailand and aging, you know, there was self help, right? But it, it's a peaceful com community. But 
how about in other areas in Thailand, which is also which is conflict ridden? Perhaps the dynamics is actually different. So it gives us more space, I think, for analysts, for scholars and practitioners to really see three years hence the pandemic, how much of our strategies were actually effective and how much of our strategies actually need to be fine tuned. Thank you very much for the uh, rich uh, reflections. We really appreciate it. I would like to say that uh, Ms. Shimada's presentation quite resonates with uh, the case studies approach, and uh, it, we hope we can connect uh, JICA's peace building approach uh, introduced by Ms. Shimada in, into, uh, with the uh, case studies uh, which was presented in this book. It's much appreciated if you can access directly to the book and to have a look at uh, case studies. We really appreciate it.